Hello! The history of great voyages and discoveries is full of tragedies. Ships and wagons have gone off course. Countless brave men have disappeared in the deserts and oceans, becoming fodder for the local fauna. And there have always been those who take the most risk and responsibilities. Captains and travelers whose enthusiasm has motivated entire crews to keep moving forward. It is very easy to inspire people who trust you, but it's also just as easy to lose both their trust and your head in a rebellion. But sometimes nothing can save you from encountering dark forces, something no human being has ever met before. The space freighter Blue Goose picks up another cargo and heads for the Archangel Stargate to return to Earth. The ship's captain, Tom, looks out the porthole and complains about the huge line at the entrance. Pilot Ray responds by complaining about his hangover from an early celebration of the mission's end. Susie, the navigator, plots the best route through the gate, and the pilot confirms the ship is ready to depart, though he notices a minor malfunction. The crew climbs into their pods to survive the hyperspeed flight in them. The gate operator of the Archangel assumes control. The wheel's yours. Be gentle with us. You need me to sing you a lullaby, Tom. As the crew sinks into the yellow goo and falls asleep, the blue goose enters the portal. Yet the next tune the captain hears is no lullaby, but the howl of a siren, which indicates considerable damage to the ship. Tom gets out of the pod and sees through the glass that they are being towed to the repair station. He wakes up Susie and informs her that things have not gone according to plan. They have ended up at an unknown station far from home. Suddenly, the cabin door opens and three silhouettes in white armor appear behind it. One of the visitors happens to be Greta, an old friend of Tom's. Is our ship damaged? Or... There was an error in your routing plot. A mistake in my work. No way. The girl explains that they are at some locky station in the Shedder Sector, very far from Earth, and a malfunction in the ship's navigation system has brought them here. In response to Susie's objection that that is impossible, Greta suggests that Archangel Dispatch may be responsible for the error. Susie refuses to believe in this theory and tries to get up, but feels sick from traveling in the capsule. So Tom and Greta place her back into the pod, so the girl's body can recover. Greta then invites Tom to follow her from the Blue Goose to the interior of some locky station to relax. In the evening, Tom is hanging out at the bar when Greta, dressed in an evening gown, approaches him and sits down next to him. They admire the view from the porthole, and the girl leans in to tell him a secret. Ever since we met in Talon, I've been hoping I'd see you again. They already had a brief affair four years ago, and Tom confesses that he sometimes regrets leaving her. The rest of the evening they spend together in Greta's cabin. Tom contemplates the fate of his ship and crew, who are still confined to their pods. And then Greta reveals that she was not being completely honest. She tells him that they are not actually in the Shedder Sector, and that the navigation error sent the ship much farther away. The girl demonstrates a holographic map, which shows that the station is actually not two years away, but hundreds of thousands of light years away from Earth. Tom, troubled by this news, asks Greta how long he and his crew have been in their capsules. Greta replies that only a few months have passed objectively for them, but back home on Earth, several centuries have gone by during that time. If you add how much time it would take for a return trip, they certainly won't recognize their home planet when they arrive. Tom struggles to come to terms with what he has heard from Greta and screams that such a situation is tantamount to death. But you're not dead, Tom. You're here with me. Greta tries to calm the man down, but he asks a reasonable question about how she ended up here herself. The girl replies that she too appeared here due to a navigation error, which apparently occurs frequently. She then offers to try and wake up his crew again. Tom opens Susie's pod and asks her to tell the last thing she remembers. She mentions the Archangel, and when she sees Greta standing nearby, recalls her dreams in which she met her. But the sight of Tom's companion does not reassure her, frightening her instead. Who are you? What the fuck are you? It's okay, Susie, it's okay. <laughs> Look at her, Tom. Tom tries to convince the girl that it's an old acquaintance of his, but Susie only calls the captain a liar and pounces on Greta, cutting her on her neck during the fight. Greta defends herself and injects Susie with a tranquilizer. This works, and Greta assures the man that she is willing to try and wake up the girl as many times as necessary. Tom puts the sleeping Susie back in her pod. Back at the cabin, Tom brushes back the hair from Greta's neck while she sleeps and notices that the cut is gone. He realizes that this is all too strange to be true, and Greta does not exist. Tom tells the girl his thoughts and she immediately replies that he is right. Their ship has indeed drifted very far away, 
And there is a station here, though not an ordinary one. Everything Tom sees is just a simulation, transmitted directly into his brain while his body is asleep in the capsule. Such a situation doesn't exactly appeal to the man, and he demands to see the reality. As you really are. You're not ready. Just be Show me, goddammit! Greta repeats again and again that he is not ready, and that many before him have lost themselves the same way. But Tom becomes more and more aggressive and insistent, and then with tears in her eyes, Greta gives in, letting him know that she really cares about him and all the lost souls who have found themselves on this station. Tom's eyes open and face the world beyond the simulation, in which his body had been all along. The captain sees his destroyed ship, entangled in organic outgrowths. He is inside an alien hive in which many other ships are trapped. Tom himself is emancipated to the point where his bones are poking through the skin, and on his sunken cheeks has grown a beard that hasn't been shaved in years. In shock, the captain takes a few steps and sees Ray's decomposing body and the worn out body of Susie, who is either dead or also in the simulation he had just been in. Sounds are heard in the distance. Someone is approaching. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. The real Greta calls to him from the back of the wrecked ship. The alien monster stares at him with its dozens of creepy eyes. Tom loses his mind at the sight of the horrible alien and his scream echoes in the hive tunnels. Seconds later, the captain wakes up peacefully in his capsule. The ship is fine, and all systems are in order. The door opens from the outside and Greta reappears in front of him. A navigational error has dropped the blue goose on the Sumlaki station, Sector Shedder, several light years away from Earth. In spite of this mishap, Tom is delighted to see a familiar face. Once upon a time, People hunted the great Jabel sharks in distant seas. During their wanderings, ships often got lost at sea, and such vessels were said to have had a bad traveling. During a terrifying nighttime storm, one of these ships attempts to get back on course, but is suddenly attacked by a giant bloodthirsty crab known as the Thanapod. Several sailors, including the captain, try to confront the monster, but its tough shell and imposing size makes their attempts futile. After killing everyone in its path, Thanapod drags his next victim, Turk, under the deck and takes shelter there. Left without both the captain and the helmsman, Torin, captain's first mate, proposes to draw lots to see who will go to confront the monster. The youngest sailor, Kurt, pulls first and gets a long straw. He is followed by Melis, who also pulls two long ones for himself and his wounded brother. The most physically powerful sailor, Jorvan, comes up and pulls out a short one, but interrupts the event in his own way. A leader. I will be picking who goes. No one dares to say a word against the big man, so the crew turns against Torrin to avoid being thrown from the height of several meters into the hold. The man has no choice but to descend to his certain death voluntarily. When Torrin goes below deck, Thanapod tries to eat him, but the sailor hides on a narrow ladder, and then the monster uses Turk's corpse to deliver his demand. It wants them to take it to the island of Faden, where the big city is located. Alone. Torin makes a deal with the beast and explains that he is the only one who can steer the ship, so the crab needs him alive. He then asks Thanapod to give him something from his stomach, a certain key, leaving the hold as if nothing had happened. Torin silently walks past the crew and then dashes away from them in a leap, reaching the captain's trunk with a six-shot revolver inside. Having ensured his safety, he reveals the monster's wish to his comrades. But while they're on the road, they will also have to somehow satisfy the hunger of the predatory crab, to which Jorvan offers to sacrifice Collis, who was wounded in the attack. His brother Melis defends him, and Torin interrupts the conflict by saying that they are all brothers in misfortune, and together, they find themselves faced with a grim and difficult decision. Unless it's already been made. Jorvan will not be able to send another man in his place again, for the lot fell on him the first time, and now Torin has chosen him as well. Crab receives a particularly hearty meal. The crew is worried that it will take at least a day and a half to reach the island, and during that time the crab will need a lot of meat. But Torin is concerned about something else, not wanting to endanger the inhabitants of Faden Island. Torin proposes to land the monster on an uninhabited island, which is even farther away. To this, a couple of the crew members recall the inhabitants of Faden for their unfriendliness and boorishness. The final decision on their destination is made by a secret vote, in which each sailor puts a mark on a slip of paper and drops it in a box. 
But soon after the procedure, Torin reveals that he left his markings on each ballot and knows who voted how. Two people wanted to fulfill the crab's request. Two cowards who voted to pass our terrible burden to the defenseless men, women, and children of- Torin pulls out his revolver and asks Melis to step aside. Kurt shrinks, preparing to take a bullet, but instead, a precise shot takes out the brothers Collis and Melis at once. A two-course meal will satisfy the monster's appetite for a long time. Later, while Torin is plotting their course, seated in the crow's nest on the mast, a crewman named Deacon attempts to commit an attempt on his life. Torin spots the assassin in time and holds him at gunpoint, forcing him to justify himself. The guy was forced to do it by other conspirators. Torin leaves him alive for now, and hears the call of the crab, who expresses to him his impatience and shows the man hundreds of his newborn offspring, who also need some meat. By evening, the entire crew gathers on the bow to see the approaching Faden Island on the horizon. Torin mentions the attempted assassination, but justifies the conspirator's actions with a general decline in morale due to the dire situation, which will soon come to an end. Tomorrow, sir, if your friend below says- Maintain course. Torin goes to sleep, ordering the crew to wake him up at the appointed hour, and soon, Five of the six sailors grab their weapons and sneak into the captain's quarters. They find Torin in his bed and begin beating him savagely. But there are only rags under the blanket. Torin, who has foreseen the attack, ambushes them and opens fire. Four shots and one axe blow later, he discovers the only living and loyal crewman in the trunk. It is the same deacon who climbed up the mast with a knife to kill him. The guy claims that he refused to participate in the rebellion and was locked up for it. Torin thanks the man and together, they dumped the crewman's body so that the smaller monsters would have something to eat. I lied before. I didn't actually mock the ballots. After this confession, he pushes Deacon down to the crabs. Absolutely all the crew members turned out to be cowards and voted identically. Torin is alone now and stops the ship near Faden Island. He goes to the hold where he tells Thanapod that they have arrived. He then tells the crab that the skins and meat of the Jable sharks they hunt cannot be used for either clothing nor food. Instead, they produce a lot of other raw material, fat, which Torrin shows off by opening the barrels with strokes of his sword. The fat spills out onto the floor, and the man raises his gun. It's not for you. Torrin fires the last, sixth bullet at the oil lamp, which emits flames onto the planks of the hold. The fat instantly catches fire, and the beast and its offsprings rush after Torrin, who leaps into the water. The massive beast, engulfed in flames, gets stuck in the narrow passageways and cannot get out. Abandoning the ship that is now enveloped in flames, Torin swims to a safe boat he prepared in advance and begins paddling towards the Faden Island. As always, look for the name of the TV series in the description of the video. In the meantime, let us know in the comments, what would you do in the captain's shoes? And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that more awesome plots come out as often as possible.